We're going to continue on with talking about um, uh, GI type issues and this is a huge one, um, talking about GI bleeding. And we were mentioning that in the other session that sometimes patients can develop stress ulcers related to physiological stress, that they have undergone some sort of drop in blood pressure or some traumatic event that that can cause ischemia to the tissues of the bowels and cause them to bleed a little bit over time. So that would be one type of GI bleeding. And actually when that happens, we don't see a dramatic change in our patient. Their vital signs are not going to be dramatically affected because it's more adaptive and it happens over time. However, if the patient has an extreme amount of blood loss quickly, then we're going to see all those changes that we see with hypovolemic shock. That the, the heart rate can go up, the blood pressure can drop, they look very pale, their respirations go up. So let's just talk about that. GI bleeding can be something that's occurring and the patient doesn't even know as if related to a cancer or a stress ulcer or it can be very serious where the ulcer they have may go all the way down into the muscularis level where the blood supply is. Remember how we talked about if it's a deep crater, a deep ulcer that it gets down to the blood vessels and those are the patients that are at risk of spontaneously losing several units of blood arterially because they have a deep ulcer. All right, so blood loss, a blood loss that occurs rapidly where you're maybe losing two or three units of blood quickly um, is going to cause those changes where we're seeing shock in front of us immediately. And that's not always going to be the case, but it can be. Um, those patients that we're watching that are GI bleed candidates or liver failure patients that we're watching that are at risk for bleeding and they call you to the room and you come in and hand them the bucket and just a lot of bright red blood comes out, you could see those changes that immediately make them uh, a risk for coding. All right, so loss of blood can cause, of course, multi-system organ failure. If we lose all of our blood volume, it's the same thing as going into shock. We risk stress to all the organs. So these are those situations you might not think about. Can a patient have a heart attack even though they have completely clean coronary arteries? Can a patient have a stroke because they have no blood flow to their brain? Yes, that's an ischemic stroke. So all of these terrible things can happen um, just because you have no blood. So our job is to try to identify that, that they need blood and give it to them as quickly as possible. We've already talked about the needs for watching the um, blood counts, the H&H &H over time, every six hours to see what's going on with that. And the difference between whether or not a patient's going to require a blood transfusion now or if we can stimulate their bone marrow to replace that blood over time. So you tell me, how do we know if the patient needs a blood transfusion now? The patient is symptomatic and like I've said I just keep bringing that up to your mind. If the patient's symptomatic we cannot wait the one to two weeks for the medication to stimulate the bone marrow. We need to give them the blood products now. And what does a symptomatic patient look like? <coughs> they have an elevated heart rate, they have confusion perhaps, dizziness, an elevated respiratory rate, Exactly. They're not going to be all there. And should we wait and see if that patient gets better on their own? They're not going to. They're not going to. Got to call the doctor on that. Okay, so that's a little bit of review of GI bleeding. We deal with it a lot. It's a very common problem. Um, what might you see in the patient's stool or bowel movement if they're GI bleeding? It could be nothing at all. It could be occult, meaning you can't see it. It could be black and tarry, and again, we know there's other things that can cause black and tarry, like iron, Pepto-Bismol, okay? Or it could be streaked with blood. It could have only blood and clots in it. It could be any variation. So if we suspect that the patient's GI bleeding, we should test to quantify that. We should do the hemocult. Right, the guaiac, that's all the same thing, and quantify that so that it can be followed up on. 
All right, disorders of the stomach. I'm not going to touch on cancer of the stomach too much, um, just to let you know that, of course, this is one of those things that could happen and is highly associated with genetics. We know that it's been mapped on the uh, human genome. Stomach cancer, colon cancer, there's certainly a genetic link. And of interest is that certain foods can predispose you to that. Um, the kinds we like the best, the ones that are smoked and charred. I mean, my mom won't eat like hamburger unless it's charred all the way. And I'm like, Mom, that, that charcoal's a carcinogen. Did you know that? She goes, I don't care. That's the only way I can tolerate it and gag it down, you know? So, unfortunately, the things that taste really good to us, smoked things, things that are preserved, are, are potentially carcinogens. So, um, the bad news is, the signs and symptoms of stomach cancer and colon cancer, by the time we have those signs and symptoms, it's too late. It's usually pretty far advanced. It doesn't cause pain. It doesn't cause dysfunction until it's, it's far advanced. So I don't like that. I really wish that we had some sort of a, a computer inside of us or alarm light that went off, but we don't at this point yet anyway. So uh, maybe in the future. So the patient usually shows up with maybe vomiting blood or indigestion, those non-specific GI complaints. And it's hard because it could be the flu or it could be something really bad. So my soapbox on that is if you've got something going on with your GI system and it's just not going away and not going away, get your belly scanned. Make sure it's nothing bad, then you can deal with it. Okay? If it's something bad, you want to take care of it as early as possible. All right, small intestines. We're going to be referring to um, the, du the duodenum or duodenum, however you pronounce it, jejunum and ileum. Those are the three parts of the small intestines, and they're way long, uh, five meters or so. I mean, we could stretch that out. That would go pretty far. Um, remember, the small intestines don't like to be touched. We will uh, address that in the other class, but I wanted to remind you that if you're going to have some sort of inflammatory condition in, in your peritoneal cavity, be it with your small bowels or the tri-city organs, the liver, the pancreas, and the gallbladder, the small intestines do not like to be touched at all. If you're opening the cavity, you're going to have to move them out of the way in order to deal with whatever organs you're dealing with. And when they get touched, remember, what do they do? They do that. They become paralyzed. All right, and they get sticky and form adhesions. So this is a huge issue. Anybody that's had an abdominal surgery in the past is at risk for adhesions in the future. How much do we see it? We see it all the time. Some of you already know that. You've cared for patients who have these issues that are recurring be because they've had issues of being touched or inflammatory conditions. All right, so what's supposed to happen um, physiologically, as the food is in your stomach and being churned up, and then it leaves through the pylorus, that's the gate, it goes into the small intestine. Right outside of the pylorus, in the small intestine, in the duodenum, you have some cells that have nice little eyeballs like this. And they're watching what's coming out of your stomach. Do we have a lot of carbs? Do we have a lot of protein? Do we have a lot of fat? Whoa, that's a lot of fat. Um, and those cells trigger the release of hormones, okay? Cholecystokinin and secretin are the hormones that are produced from those duodenal cells. And they are the ones that stimulate the tri-city organs so that exact amounts of um, pancreatic juices are produced. We get the right mix of bile, okay, amylase, lipase, and trypsin. So that is very important, knowing that those duodenal cells are there to stimulate the tri-city organs, all right, and get the right mix for us for absorption. So what happens in the small intestine is that pH of 2 that's in your stomach right away gets neutralized, all right? We need the pancreatic juices, which are full of base, to neutralize that pH and bring it back up into the 7.4 range for absorption. That's the way things are supposed to happen. Okay, any questions about that? Okay. And the main job in the small intestines is absorption of the nutrients. So get, tell me what happens if you get three or four feet cut out. 
you have problems with absorption. absorption of nutrients, exactly. All right, the large intestine too is going to be covered in this next set, and the large intestine is a little bit shorter. Remember that um, it uh, ascends transverse and descends over on the left side. Its main job is to reabsorb water. So if we take out all the large bowel, we do a complete colectomy, what's going to happen with this patient? They're going to have trouble with reabsorption of water. So one of the things they'll have to be taught is it's going to be important for you to drink a lot more water. You, you've lost your ability to conserve it. All right, so let's start talking about some of the disease processes that occur in the small and large intestine. intestine. And uh, the first one is irritable bowel disease, affectionately called IBD. IBD. This is not a diagnosis that you want. You really don't. This isn't. It, it could be IBS, irritable bowel syndrome. And how do we define it? If you have certain set of symptoms over three months, more than 25% of the time, and that has to do with you know gas, bloating, diarrhea, cramping, those types of symptoms, you'll be able to acquire this diagnosis of IBS or IBD. Now, general things that can be done to improve that situation would be management of stress, increasing fiber, and avoiding caffeine. Those are things that generally help patients who have IBD or IBS. But let's get a little bit more specific about the patho that you might be dealing with. Okay? Under IBD or IBS, um, the patient may be dealing with ulcerative colitis. Okay? Ulcerative colitis is a lesion that forms circumferentially, which means all the way around in a circle, okay? And it's pretty much on the surface layers of the bowel tissue. So it's not a deep lesion, it's on the surface. So as the patient gets inflamed, they'll have a little bit of bleeding, okay? And they'll have a lot of, of bloody types of mucoid stool, a lot. But it's only on the surface and it's all the way around. So if they're scoping that patient and they look inside, they'll be able to know, oh, that, that looks like ulcerative colitis. So as many as 30 to 40 bloody mucoid stools. Now I'm very happy to say I've not experienced this personally, but I have a cat that has it. <laughs> he is now an indoor cat. When he would go outside, and eat things and do things, he would have flares. And the vet told me, your cat has irritable bowel. I'm like, I know what that means. <laughs> <laughs> and so when he would flare, I would find spots of bloody mucoid stool all over my house. I'm surprised I haven't put him down, aren't you? Uh, luckily, uh, being an indoor cat has solved that problem. He's not flaring anymore, but... <laughs> I have tile. I did have carpet. I now have tile. <laughs> it doesn't matter. He still drops it on the bed and other places when he flares. Yeah, it's not nice. I'm like, I really love you! <laughs> Cleaning up. <laughs> Mom, you can't put him down. Oh. Do you want to clean this up? No. <laughs> He's a beautiful cat. You can see his picture in my office if you want to. I'm not sure he's worth it, but I haven't put him down yet. He doesn't flare so much anymore because he's not outside. The other one that pretty much is covered under IBD or IBS is, also, uh, is um, Crohn's disease. I'm sorry. And... Um, Crohn's disease can pretty much occur anywhere from the mouth to the rectum. And what you see are cobblestone type lesions. These areas that you see here are normal tissue. But what is in between that, which would be the grout or the mortar, if you were thinking of a cobblestone pathway, um, is where the disease is. And those areas form very deep craters. And they go way down into the bowel layers definitely through the muscularis and they can actually cause perforation and the lesions can form into the bowel loop layer that's underneath. So that can cause formation of what we call fistulas. A fistula is a word that means opening one thing to another 
that shouldn't be there. It shouldn't be like that. So patients who have Crohn's disease can have a lot of problems. And we see numerous, numerous patients with Crohn's disease that come into the hospital and lose little pieces of their bowel at a time. Six inches here, eight inches there. It's an ongoing type issue. All right, so cobblestone lesions, and um, as far as symptoms for them, uh, similar intermittent diarrhea, colicky type pain, not usually as much bleeding. All right, so uh, here we go again. Uh, remember how we did with ulcer disease? We kind of contrasted the differences rather than going through sides. So let's see if you've absorbed anything we've talked about so far. When we're dealing with uh, irritable bowel syndrome or disorders, the two main diseases that fall under that are ulcerative colitis and Crohn's disease. So which one has continuous lesions involving the mucosal layer? Ulcerative colitis is the one that has circumferential continuous lesions involving the mucosal or upper layer, surface layer. That's ulcerative colitis. Good thing we're having these questions. Okay, which one has skipping lesions involving the entire intestinal wall? That is Crohn's disease. And when they scope those patients and do colonoscopies, they can see the difference. Okay, it's obvious when they look at it. All right, common complications of fistulas, abscess, and obstruction. That is Crohn's disease, all right. And how about bloody stools common? That's ulcerative colitis, my cat. Mm -hmm. And which one has an increased risk of developing cancer? I didn't talk about that. It's actually ulcerative colitis is the one that has been shown to provide increased risk of forma formation of dysplastic cells, cells that grow that are not normal. So ulcerative colitis is most linked with colon cancer. Now either of these patients can come in with all of these symptoms and you end up taking care of them and providing TPN, total parental nutrition, they become NPO. Um, and a lot of them end up with colostomies. Sometimes they're temporary, sometimes they get put back together later. A colostomy is where they take part of the bowel, they bring it to the surface of the skin, and basically their bowel movement empties in a bag. Okay? Are you familiar with that? Yes. Okay. So these are issues. These would be hard issues for me if I had to deal with that. I'd still want to live. I know I'd want to live. Life is important to me. But having to deal with the colostomy, that'd be challenging. Now, before I move on, I just want to say there's likely some of you that may have these issues or your family might. It doesn't mean they're going to have all these things happen to them. Some people have very mild cases. But I have to teach you an extreme so that you know the general stuff and what you might see on boards. All right, how do we diagnose it? H&P is history and physical. What are the patient's symptoms? What are they presenting with? Are they having it more than 25% of the time for three months? All right. Sigmoidoscopy or colonoscopy, where they're going to look up inside and identify lesions or not. Biopsy might be something that they'll do. A barium enema is going to outline the structures, right? So if you give them a barium enema and you see that the bowel is kind of looking like this, which do you think they have? They have Crohn's, right? If they have ulcerative colitis, it's going to look like that. They won't get much out of that result. You see the difference? But if you scope them, you'll be able to see it. So which do you think would be the better diagnostic tool? Scope. Scoping. I agree. Stool cultures, and that would rule out something else. If you have a stool culture that's positive for an organism, guess what? Your patient doesn't have ulcerative colitis or Crohn's. They might have some sort of amoebic dysentery, especially if they've just recently traveled out of the country. Okay. Um, CAT scans might give us information too about perforations, abscesses, and things like that. Now one of the medications they give is called azolvidine, and that's an anti-inflammatory drug, and it's not well absorbed. Why is that better than um, anti-inflammatory drugs that are well absorbed? They don't go into your body, so they're going to stay right where you need them, right in the bowels. Now. Um, just so you know, Crohn's too is considered autoimmune these days. 
the research is showing that patients with Crohn's disease have an elevated tumor necrosing factor and that it's an autoimmune type uh, issue. That's the way they're leaning with that right now. And that's why the patients may respond very well with corticosteroids, prednisone, those types of drugs. They need elemental diets. What that means to us is kind of pre-digested. If we're going to be giving them nutrition, they may not be able to uh, digest it well, so we need it in its most simple form so that they can get the best out of it, or we give it intravenously. These patients could be during a flare on uh, TPN through a PICC line or through a central line for several months until um, they uh, go into remission. All right, infectious colitis, don't we love it? Don't we love it? If you have not experienced Clostridium difficile yet, just wait. Anybody like to share with the group what Clostridium difficile is? C. diff. C. diff in the hospital, we affectionately call it C. diff. It is usually an opportunistic type infection that occurs because a patient is on antibiotics, which kills off normal flora. How do you know? How do you know? It smells. It's watery, it's frothy, it's sort of uh, brownish black. And good luck getting a stool specimen because when it comes out it soaks into everything. It's not like you can collect it into a cup. And does it just happen like once or twice a day? No. No. You just get them cleaned up and turned back around and everything's beautiful and it's like you hear the gas and you're like, no! <laughs> there it is coming out again. It's mucoid a lot of times too. It's, it's very uncomfortable for the patient. They're all apologizing to you. Okay, so the weird thing is with Clostridium, the thing which can cause it is also its treatment. Right? The vancomycin is what can cause it, but it's also its treatment. What you need to know, what you really do want to know, because you're going to be taking care of that patient day after day, all right, is that recommended and best way to treat it is PO. PO. The doctors may want to argue, stay your course, be persistent. You want PO, flagell, or vancomycin to treat C. diff. Why? You're putting the antibiotic where the problem is. Exactly. IV does not get to internal GI tract as well as PO does. I had a patient that was um, with C. diff. Doctor would not change it over. The patient stayed with C. diff for a week on IVs. I'm like, you know what? It's not working day after day. It's not working. It's not working. It took a week. Both the patient and I had to suffer with that for a week. So I'm just telling you about the importance of oral. Most of the time they'll tell you they don't care. Good, switch it to oral. The patient will clear up in a day or two. Otherwise, they may not. Some respond to IV, but not all. All right, E. coli. This is our fast food epidemics. These are the things that uh, occur from uh, Wendy's, McDonald's, I don't want to leave anybody out, Jack in the Box, you know all of them. I'm not trying to talk bad on any of those. I've done my fair share of burgers from every single one of them. Carl's. Oh, yeah. Yum. Six dollar <laughs> burger. <laughs> Bacon guacamole burger. <laughs> one of my favorites. Okay, what's the issue? The issue is E. coli contamination and it's from the cows. It's the cows E. coli that's the problem. It's a different E. coli than what we have E. coli. Do you know what I mean? Everybody has normal flora, humans do, of E. coli. The E. coli that's in a cow is different and if we end up getting meat that's contaminated with cow E. coli, it makes us sick. So all the packages of meat that you buy in the store say cook this to a certain temperature, cook it thoroughly, and that kills it. We eat it all the time, but it's dead. Don't think you don't eat it. You're eating all those pathogens all the time. Hopefully they've been cooked properly, so they're dead. That's a terrible thought, isn't it? <laughs> but it's all contaminated pretty much. So, let me ask you a question. Which one's going to be more likely to be contaminated? The hamburger or the steak? Steak. Hamburger. 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 Hamburger.
It has to do with surface area. That's the issue. The surface area is the part that becomes contaminated. It's the part that holds on to that E. coli. So if you do it, you, you, can, you can have a steak that's still mooing if you sear the edges well. You can have it moo. It can be rare as all get out and you're fine. Sear it, kill everything on the edges, you're good. The hamburger that's rare, that's where you're taking the risk. That's the risk because all those surface areas inside may not have been exposed to enough heat to kill the pathogen. Okay? So beware, not the steak's okay. It can move, that's fine. Don't let your hamburgers move. That's a problem. Okay, and this is a, di a disease process that kind of has to run its course. There's not really anything we can do. It sort of has to run its course. And so it's very um, dangerous for children. And you've probably heard of children in the news who've died because of E. coli contamination. The problem is they become very dehydrated. And that is often the issue with any type of diarrhea. They become dehydrated and because of not enough blood pressure, they go into acute renal failure, okay? So treatment of infectious colitis related to um, E. coli has to do with symptomatic management, make sure they have plenty of fluids so they don't dehydrate. All right, divert. Um, I'm not sure I know why they don't help. They're just not considered effective or it's, I'm not sure, they just, it would, it would probably damage your normal flora. I don't know that that's the reason. It's just not uh, touted as being the treatment of choice. And I'm not sure why that is. It's, it doesn't respond to it well or causes more complications or problems. So it's a symptomatic management. It has to run its course. Much the way with other food poisonings, you know, you got to get it out of your system. You got to flush it out. And that's a lot of times the way they take care of it. Okay. Um, okay, diverticuli. Um, diverticuli, uh, did we draw a picture of that on the board before? Yeah. What it is? When you have a, a loop of bowel and the growth goes internal, we call it a polyp. So that's like a polyp inside the bowel loop. Okay. If we have a part that sticks out, that's called the diverticuli. Now that picture there is showing you a person with like, I don't know how many I lost count diverticuli. These are the pocket openings right here and these are the diverticuli hanging off the side. So that's extreme. I'm not trying to tell you that all patients that have diverticuli look like that. They might have one or two of these pockets. But the problem becomes that what used to be part of their bowel is now poked out so that the wall is very thin compared to the thickness of the bowel. And those become little pockets where things can collect. So that if the patient eats a lot of seeds or corn, they can become plugged up. Even stool can plug it up. And as it plugs up, it can swell. And as it swells, it can burst. And that's our big complication, that the patient can perforate. So that's what we worry about. So with diverticular disease, if the patient, if we know they have diverticulosis, condition of having diverticuli, the normal treatment would be stay away from refined foods. Be sure that you eat plenty of fiber. That's how we manage a patient who has diverticulosis. But if they get a pocket and they flare, then we have to decide what we're going to do. So a lot of times the doctors will bring them into the hospital, give them IV fluids, antibiotics, make them NPO and sit on them for two or three days and hope that the inflammation goes down on its own. That's the usual conservative management for a patient with diverticulitis. If they are afraid that it's going to burst or rupture, then they have to decide risk outweigh benefit. Do I need to take the patient to surgery and resect this? That's dangerous because they come in like a hot abdomen, right? They have a temp, they have an elevated white count, and they got belly pain. It's not you don't really want to take a patient to surgery in that situation. They're already inflamed. So they have to decide one way or the other what are they going to do, a conservative management or not. Worst issue, perforation. What assessment would you see in your patient who's perforated? You're going to see pain. 
You're going to see an elevated temp, temp and white count. Yes. What are you going to see in physical assessment? The firm, board-like, hard as a rock type abdomen. When the patient complains of that, you need to pay attention. And if you get it in a question, you need to pay attention. That should be making you immediately think risk of perforation. And that has to be reported to the doctor right away. All right, so diverticulitis, not diverticulitis, diverticulosis, condition of diverticuli, can be diagnosed with a sigmoidoscopy. They'll go inside, they'll see those pockets, and they can diagnose it. If the patient is not flaring, and they're just living with those pockets, increasing dietary fiber is the method that we try to keep them under control. If the pocket fills up, and we're in trouble, we're going to be looking at antibiotics and IV fluids, NPO, and possibly surgical resection. Could that patient end up with a colostomy? Yes. Hopefully they'll be able to reattach the patient later. Know that any patient that gets a colostomy hopes they're going to do a reanastomosis later, that they're going to reconnect it later, hopefully. Bless you. Okay, appendicitis, our most common surgical emergency. I don't know that we're still exactly clear what an appendix is supposed to do for us. This is sort of a hanging thing, a little hanging chad. That's appropriate, huh? Election's only a, a few days away. Um, hanging chad. We certainly can live without it, but the appendix can get jammed up much like a diverticuli can uh, with what they call a fecal lift. That's just like a little piece of poo. You know, it can get stuck in there and cause an inflammation, and um, that can be really difficult for the patient. And we will see, again, all the signs and symptoms of a hot abdomen, which are elevated white blood cell count, elevated temp, and belly pain. And we are obligated to make sure that any patient that shows up with those signs and symptoms gets what? They get a CAT scan. Worst thing that could happen to them? They perforate. Most important clinical assessment for perforation? Hard, firm, board-like abdomen. You think you might see those again somewhere? I think you might see those somewhere again. Yes. So we'll do the usual workup to try to figure out what's going on. A laparotomy is basically where they cut into the lap. That's why I remember it. If I'm sitting, I have a lap, right? Okay. A laparotomy means they're going to cut in and look inside the belly. If they find an inflamed appendix, they may well be able to remove it laparoscopically. They do that these days or they may have to do open. So they can do a lap appy or they can do an open appy depending on the patient's issue. A lot of times it has to do with if they're very large and obese, maybe they can't get the tools in um, to do that or if they're afraid it's going to rupture, they may go ahead and open them so that we're not having a lot of infectious and inflamed things ending up in the peritoneal cavity. Um, interesting appendic appendicitis issues. Um, children. This is a hard one for us as parents. Uh, children have belly pain. They have it. We don't a lot of times know whether it's appendicitis or not. So if your child is having belly pain and they have a fever, take them to the doctor. That's the rule of thumb for you. If they're having belly pain and they're not having a fever, okay. But if they're having belly pain and they have a fever, take them to the doctor. Worst case scenario would be an appendicitis. And the thing is with a child, once they rupture, they feel a lot better. So you could have the belly pain, you could have the temp, and then they rupture and they feel better. But then within 24 hours, they might not make it. They can have sepsis. So if it's a child that's having a lot of belly pain, and where is the appendix? Yes. and characteristic of identifying an appendicitis is that the patient can actually identify where that hurts with one finger. Mm -hmm. So if they're very sure about where it is, tell them, can, point for mommy. Point with your finger. Show mommy where the pain is, not just like they have stomach pain. Because they'll call it stomach pain because they think that's the only thing that's in there. Mm -hmm. You know, with kids. My stomach hurts or my belly hurts because they think that's all that's in there is a big tank. They don't know differently. So if you can have them point with one finger exactly where the pain is, and they point there, and they have a temp, don't, don't mess around. Be sure and get them. It may, it may not be, but you don't want to take that risk. We have seen some cases where the children don't survive because they perforate. 
So they're at higher risk. They feel better after they, they're, they're going to go back to playing after they, after they rupture. And they're kids. So uh, just a, a special segue for children. All right, colorectal cancer. I'm not going to spend a lot of time on this other than to say that there is a family history. We know there's a genetic link. It's on the human genome. It's been mapped. Um, higher risk for those people who have ulcerative colitis, um, polyps, or they're over the age of 50. And these are the reasons why they send us home, well, they send me home, with those nice little stool for occult blood cards now. I get my annual physical every year, I get to take these cards home and collect little pieces of stool specimen, put it on the card, and then guess where I put it? In the mail. In the mail. Yeah. Yes, poo in the mail. <laughs> Hope that envelope stays shut. Anyway, that screener identifies many patients who have early stomach, colon, right, cancer. So I know I don't appreciate having to do that. It's annoying, it's awful, I don't like doing it. But if I have a cancer of the stomach, small intestines, or large intestines, I want to find it early, not late, right? So encourage your family members to go ahead, and go ahead and do at least that. They're still going to probably try to weasel out of their colonoscopies for a couple years. I want to do those right away. But those stool for occult blood tests are what identify early cancer patients. You have that on the next slide. All right. Intestinal motility disorders. Oh, we love them. Oh, we love them. So let's make sure we talk about them for a few minutes. Diarrhea. It means... It goes through. That's what the word means. Yes, it does. It definitely goes through. Many of your children think they're dying. They think all of their insides are falling out of them. Okay? Diarrhea can have a purpose. It may have the purpose of flushing out the bowel. So if you have a patient that has diarrhea because they have food poisoning, if they have food poisoning, it's necessary for the bowels to wash themselves out. So in that type of patient, we don't want to stop the diarrhea. How many of you have worked long-term care? Wonderful, then you're going to understand what the BM book is, right? All of those patients have a tracking. We have a tracking mechanism for making sure they have their bowel movements. One of the things that happens in long-term care is the patients get constipated. They get obstructions of bowel movement. We have to stay on top of that to make sure it doesn't happen. Guess what? If your patient doesn't have a bowel movement for two or three days and then gets diarrhea, that's bad. You know what that means? The bowel is trying to rid itself of a plug. So that's one of those tracking things that we keep in the long-term care facilities because that's one of the places where it happens the most. I'm not saying we want to keep those patients with diarrhea all the time. That's wrong too. Should we be giving them so much laxatives that they're peeing water all the time? That's going too far the other direction. But diarrhea could be a sign of intestinal, partial intestinal obstruction from bowel movement, especially if they haven't gone for two or three days. So we have to keep that in mind. When you're giving your anti-diarrheals, make sure that it's going to be safe for the patient to receive them, that it's in their best interest to receive them. Make sense? Okay. Constipation. Well, that seems to be the curse and the problem for a lot of our elderly patients. I remember it was first introduced to me in my first semester of nursing school, and I was like asked to help with the daily constitution. This elderly female patient said, Honey, you're going to have to help me with my daily constitution. <laughs> like, what's that? You know, or the better therapeutic response, how do I help you with that? How would you like me to assist you with that while you're using the nurse face, right? And how would you like me to assist you with that? I'm thinking to myself, I don't know what she's talking about. <laughs> Many of our elderly patients have a routine. They have a routine. They get up, they eat their breakfast, they take their laxative, they go to the bathroom, they give themselves an enema, and they go. And they do that every day. And they like it that way. If they have a routine, don't mess with success. Even if they're in the hospital, do what they want. Unless it's, it, unless it's in some way not good for them. Maybe they want to uh, change those habits because they're not helpful. 
you need to know the things we can do to prevent constipation. You could get a state board question about that. What's one of the best things we can do that's not a drug? Increase fluids, increase fiber, increase activity. We can increase their ability to manage that without using a drug. Do we want them to use drugs? No. Some of them can become habit forming. Do we want them to use enemas? No, we don't really want to. So we want to teach them the things that they can do. Now, your patients that are on pain medicine, aren't a lot of our elderly patients on pain medication for chronic pain, back pain and such? That places them at risk for constipation because narcotics decrease GI motility. Those patients should be on stool softeners so they don't get constipated. Those are okay. That's a helpful thing. Now, what about the patient who's completely healthy in their 40s or 50s and all of a sudden they get constipation? Would we expect that? No, we'd be asking, have you changed your exercise? Have you changed your diet? Have you, you know, are you doing something different? Taking pain medicines? No, 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 no. Now I'm worried about a blockage. Now I'm worried about does this patient have a tumor or a cancer? All right, so we can have constipation as a part of the aging process. And guess what, if they get a blockage in the, the elderly population, do you think we miss it more often because they come in with constipation and they live with, we do. We're more likely to pick it up in the 40 or 50 year old person who has colon cancer and, and more to ignore it in the elderly person who comes in with their bag of bowel remedies. So we have to put it in context. Is it an issue, is it not an issue? Is it related to bowel obstruction and, and whatnot? So I kind of gave you some ideas of how you're gonna see it in the workplace. Now fecal impaction, that, that uh, is you know constipation gone all the way wrong. And uh, patients can die of it. And, and that's the issue. I had um, a student, that she was working in a, a group home and she was asking me if the person who owned the group home could be sued because a patient went to the hospital with a fecal impaction. And I said, well, what types of services does the group home provide? Is the group home responsible for providing medications? Is the group home responsible for monitoring the patient's activities such as bowel movements and urination? And I said, if the group home has listed those as their responsibilities, and if the patient has a problem with that and it's not being caught up on, then I would think there might be an issue. I don't know. Was the patient non-compliant? Was the patient not willing to take their meds? But do you see where I'm getting at? If you have a patient in a long-term care facility, is there an obligation to make sure they're going number two? Yes. And if we're not on top of that and the patient develops a fecal impaction and dies, not because of a tumor or anything else, could there be liability? Yes. It's possible. It's possible. We don't think of it that way, necessarily. Now, sometimes the only way you can get rid of a, a fecal impaction is by digital removal, and that's not one of the funner jobs that a nurse has to do sometimes. You know what I'm saying? Yeah, yeah okay, good. Now, I don't have to give a lot of talks about that. Sometimes our patients remove their own fecal impactions as well. If the patients have big boxes of gloves in their bathroom, you're doing home health care, I'm just saying they might be using them to give themselves suppositories or other things. You will become the super sleuth. You will see stuff and you will start to think things and then you will ask questions. I know she had a box of gloves in your bathroom. That's all you have to say. Just wait and see what they say. Are they going to disclose anything to you or not? But it's not to judge them, it's to understand their habits and to help them. There might be better ways for accomplishing things or not, okay? All right. So fecal impaction, we don't want to let our patients get there. It could be a sign of a cancer or an obstruction as well. And if it's not removed, it can cause ischemia and perforation. It's, they're talking a lot about it in the critical care journals too. Translocation of bacteria. Translocation of bacteria could be because of fecal impaction. The bowel bacteria, E. coli, ends up in the bloodstream. Or you know what else they're discussing? And this is a very interesting one. 
translocation of bacteria because we're not using the gut for nutrition. If we're not using the intestinal tract to absorb and give us nutrition, that can cause the intestinal tract to become a source of sepsis or translocation of bacteria. Does that blow your mind? We're going to talk about in the other class the need for early nutrition and using the gut to do that rather than IVs if we can to help prevent sepsis. Okay, I wasn't taught that in school. That's latest evidence-based research. Patients who don't eat through their gut may be at risk for translocation of E. coli bacteria into the bloodstream. All right, here's some pictures of some other intestinal motility disorders. The first one is intussusception. Intussusception is this one, where we see part of the bowel loop goes inside of the other. It's like a telescoping. This is the most common cause of bowel obstruction in infants. The way we try to treat it is conservatively. We give an osmotic enema. Okay, what does the word osmotic mean to you? It means that it has pulling power and it's going to take water to itself. So if we give 100 cc, well we wouldn't give that much in an infant, if we gave say a 25 cc amount of osmotic enema and we put it inside the bowel, inside the rectum, and it's osmotic, it's going to pull water to it and that volume will expand and if the volume expands, what do we hope happens to this telescoped bowel? That it pops out. And that would be the most conservative way to manage intussusception. Now, uh, state board question that some of my students have had. What type of bowel movement will you see in an infant who has intussusception? Current. current jelly. I never was able to describe what current jelly was. I had a student bring me a jar. It looks like cranberries in a gelatinous type of substance. I kept it for a long time until it turned black and then I had to throw it out. I used to bring it to class, but you yourself can look at currant jelly in the store if you want to. Mm -hmm. Okay, a volvulus. A volvulus is a twisting of the bowel. This could happen with an adhesion. It could happen with an adhesion. When the bowel twists like that, just the same as when you have an intussusception, you need to think about the fact that the blood supply to that part of the bowel could be very disrupted, right? The mesentery or the blood supply that goes to all of this might be very disrupted. So this bowel could become necrotic. It could become necrotic. So with these issues, we worry about is there going to be ischemic bowel or necrotic bowel. All right. And then paralytic ileus. Remember, ileus means obstruction. Those words mean the same thing. So if they tell you your patient has an ileus, it means they have an obstruction or things aren't moving. It should mean the same thing to you in your brain. Now when is it normal for a patient to have a paralytic ileus? After surgery. All the bowels get touched. They do that. They're going to be like that for 24 to 48 hours. They're not going to do nothing. How can we make those bowels start to work again? Get your patient up and get them moving. Get them walking. Exactly. So after an abdominal surgery, a paralytic ileus is normal. Okay. It occurs in other patients for other reasons. For instance, a patient who maybe has a neurogenic issue. And this is your diabetic again who has problems with neuropathy. I'm not talking about peripheral neuropathy. I'm talking about autonomic neuropathy. Okay? The motility of the GI tract slows down in diabetics. Their nervous innervation of the GI tract is disrupted. So paralytic ileus can happen when we expect it and it can be um, pathological. It can be disease related as well. All right, bowel obstruction. We see these a lot. You need to know a lot about bowel obstruction. It can be either the small or the large bowel which becomes obstructed. How do we know? How do we know? We start with the symptoms that the patient complains of. Give me some examples. Vomiting. vomiting. Why do they vomit? It's not able to go through, so it's going to come back up. What about their belly? 
distend. It's going to distend. What about their bowel sounds? Above the area of the, of the obstruction, their bowel sounds could be very hyperactive. Below the area of the obstruction, they could be absent or very quiet. Sometimes we'll see that. Then we start doing scans, all right? X-rays or CAT scans. The thing that happens is we see separation of the contents. Have you ever seen one of the old bottles of uh, wishbone Italian dressing? Seen one of the old bottles? They're not emulsified so that the oil and the water are separate. Now before you serve that, what do you have to do? You gotta shake it up, right? When you have a patient that has a bowel obstruction, it's like the old bottles of wishbone dressing. The layers separate. The fat and the water separate and the air goes to the top. They're looking for air fluid levels. If they see a separation of the contents, they got an obstruction. Does that make sense? It's not being shaken up. Peristalsis has been disrupted. So if you get your report back and it says gas fluid, or it says uh, air fluid levels are present, then there's no motility. So things separate out. That's how they diagnose it. And they'll see a distended lots of air and then all of a sudden there's nothing and it just looks normal. So that's, that's what you're looking for. Now what if they tell you in your report that you have free air in the peritoneal cavity? Then what do you have? Perforation. Perforation. Unless they've had a recent surgery. A recent surgery would account for free air in the peritoneal cavity. Otherwise that air should be contained within the bowel loops. So if it perforates and there's a hole in the bowel, that air escapes into the cavity. That's perforation. All right, so as the pressure increases, we're going to see other problems that the patient can have. Number one, the patient's not going to want to take a deep breath. When you take a deep breath, it makes your diaphragm go down. And when your diaphragm goes down, it puts pressure on your belly. And that makes it hurt. So when patients have abdominal pain, how do you think they breathe? They're not doing deep breathing. Every time they take a deep breath, it hurts. So one of the common complications that we see with patients with bowel obstructions, pneumonia and atelectasis. The patient that has a bowel obstruction and nothing moving, especially if pressure's building up, can perforate. Then they get peritonitis, it's all bad. And absorption stops. When patients come in with a bowel obstruction, they're not eating, nothing's staying down. And remember, like your electrolytes have to be replaced on a daily basis. So when you look at their lab reports, their sodium's low, their chloride's low, their mag is low, their calcium, all those levels are gonna be low across the board. That should make you think bowel obstruction, not eating, something's going on here, they're not eating or bowel obstruction, those are the classic profiles we see. And if we treat them with a common therapy, meaning we wanna decompress that stomach, they might start having acid-base imbalances too. If I drop an NG tube, a nasogastric tube, and I attach it to suction, what am I removing? I'm removing acid from the system. If I remove acid from the system, what imbalance will the patient go into? Metabolic alkalosis. Okay, very good. So we have to keep all those things in mind. Bowel obstruction can be a killer. Common treatments for bowel obstruction First of all, we got to find out if the patient has a cancer. Before we start treating them, an NG tube is okay no matter what. We can drop an NG tube, but the other therapies, we got to know whether or not there's a cancer. Okay, common treatment, if it's a cancer, is just put the NG tube down to give them relief, and then they're going to go to surgery. If it's an adhesion, those fibrous bands that form, and they want to try to relieve it conservatively, what they're going to do is put an NG tube down, put it to low suction, and they're going to blast from the bottom. Enemas, suppositories, blast, blast, blast. Decompress, blast. And hopefully it'll open up. Great, we don't have to take the patient to surgery. We don't have to lyse the adhesions. Because when we go in there to lyse those adhesions, what are we going to do? We're probably going to make more. 
So many of your patients might sit there with a bowel obstruction. They've had a history of a, of a you know, gallbladder removal, and then they've had a history of lysis of adhesions, and they're like, we really don't want to open you up again. You've got a lot of scar tissue. We're going to sit on it for a few days, decompress and blast from the bottom, and you and the patient are both hoping that they're going to start going. And a lot of times they do. Sometimes they don't. Okay. All right. Questions about bowel obstructions? You're going to take care of a lot of patients who have those if you work in med surge, especially medical. All right, malabsorption syndrome. The only reason I put this picture up here is to remind you that parts of the small bowel have certain jobs, and if you cut it out, you will lose function. Many times we don't think about that. The patient has a bowel resection for this, that, or the other reason. All of that is supposed to be there. We were designed with all of that bowel for a reason. If we cut some of it out, things aren't going to work like they're supposed to. The patient will lose some degree of function. All right, they might have malabsorption syndromes. A couple that we listed here just to make sure we're on the same page with malabsorption syndromes. A pancreatic insufficiency. If the patient's not making pancreatic um, enzymes, you will see um, malabsorption of fat primarily. And there's a certain sort of stool that's created. We mentioned that at the beginning of this section. It starts with an S. Do you remember? Steatorrhea is the word that we use to describe fat in the stool. And that's what you're going to see in a patient who has a malabsorption syndrome related to pancreatitis or pancreas malfunction. Lactase is the enzyme that's needed to digest milk protein, lactose right? Or not, it's sugar, protein. So uh, lactase deficiency will cause the patient to have, it looks like IBD or IBS, but it's an enzyme deficiency. You can uh, suffer with it or you can take lactate, right? Which is replacing the enzyme that's absent in those people, but that is a malabsorption syndrome. After they drink or eat milk products, they get gas and they get bloating and they feel miserable and they don't want to be around anybody and nobody wants to be around them. <laughs> okay. uh, bile deficiency. First of all, if we have a bile deficiency or if we have a, an obstruction of the biliary duct, remember that the bowel movement changes. It is the bile which creates the collar in your bowel movement. So if you have an obstruction of your biliary tree, your bowel movement turns what color? White, chalky, gray, something like that. This also can cause a problem with fat malabsorption. All right, so just thinking about malabsorption syndromes. And if you have uh, other surgeries, we're going to talk about in the next class, like um, uh, gastric bypass. When you have <coughs> gastric bypass surgery, that imposes, that causes a malabsorption syndrome. Right? It makes structures smaller. It makes things go through the track faster. Many of those patients end up having diarrhea. Some of them have it for life. Okay? It causes a malabsorption syndrome. All right, let's ca cover uh, disorders of the peritoneum. Remember the peritoneum is the covering of the cavity. We can use the peritoneum as a treatment locality. It is a semi-permeable membrane is what I'm getting at. And we can use that fact to um, cause treatment for the patient. I mean, we've been talking about peritonitis, but we can do what's called peritoneal dialysis using the peritoneal cavity and the peritoneal structures, meaning that we can inflow fluid to the patient's belly and usually it's a sugar-based fluid that causes an osmotic change, right? Can pull water to it and waste products. We'll talk about that in the renal section. We'll talk about it a lot more. So the peritoneal cavity and the peritoneal tissues can be used as a semi-permeable membrane. What we're worried about in the GI system is the integrity of that. We want to be certain that this doesn't become infected, right? It's a sterile cavity. If we have a perforation and we get um, bacteria in the peritoneal cavity, we're going to have a lot of problems. Very hard to clear up, can take several weeks, several months, and all those tissues are convoluted in there all over the place. So if we have a perforation, we can get several abscess pockets. They're difficult to clear. They can become loculated and we can't get to them. So patients may have to have removal of abscess by CT guidance. Removal of abscess by CT guidance. Perforation is very difficult to 
clear up the abscess pockets. It is a leading cause of death post-abdominal surgery. It is very difficult to clear up. You, we've talked about sources. Okay. Um, what do we do when they know they have peritonitis? Uh, they may decide to open them up and flush them out. They may decide to open up certain areas and put drains. Uh, it varies depending on the patient and what their issues are um, related to peritonitis. It's usually going to be a longer course of care. Patients usually made NPO. They don't get to eat anything. We're going to give bowel rest. That's why we took the NG tube to suction. We don't want anything going through the track. And we're going to be doing a lot of supportive things. Fluids, electrolytes, nutrition, pain medicine, and so forth. It's more of a long course.